This book is a nonstop parade of random background characters. When you couple this with the review warning that this book felt like a walking advertisement for the rest of the series, yeah, simply bad writing all around. Hello and welcome to the Connotation Points video snark. If you came here because you thought that this was an audiobook, please stick around and maybe learn some reading and listening comprehension skills. I read books, discuss what went wrong, and how they can possibly be fixed. I'm continuing my read-through of Icebreaker by Hannah Grace. Not the first video, go check out the others. Links are posted below. Chapter 5. Your boyfriend looks like he wants to murder me. Well, that's odd, I'm used, moving so that we're on the same step. I don't have a boyfriend. I'm sorry, what? The narration seems to have forgotten for a second who Brian is. It's like Anastasia is mercifully single for two seconds. Waiting for her at the bottom of the stairs is Aaron, who is angry that Anastasia is with some random guy. The book does remember that Ryan exists after a moment, only for her to tell us that following the meeting with director Skinner, Aaron and Ryan got into a fight. Ryan wanted to take Anastasia out to eat. Aaron said that he wanted to be the most toxic man in her life and reminded Anastasia that she was only good to him if she had an eating disorder. To make matters worse, Aaron now says the following. Thought you were collecting team captains like Pokemon. Wow, buddy, don't be shy. Tell her how you really feel. I've never done figure skating, let alone couple skating. Can't she request a new partner? Can you not trade partners at the end of a skating season? Why is she still with this jerk wad? This behavior didn't come out of nowhere. Except I'm more hung up over how Aaron forcing an eating disorder on her than him implying that she's easy. Like, obviously, neither of them are good, but one of these things is more damaging to her long-term health. Nate calmly tells Aaron that if he's going to act like that, then he's going to have to leave. Aaron then asks like he knows better than Nate, even going so far as to drop a rumor about some freshman getting pregnant, which is the cause of the rink getting trashed. Nate is obviously quick to jump to the defense and insist that it's not what happened, but going back to the previous chapter, he asked literally a singular person, who didn't even have proof that it was what happened, and also there was no indication as to why Nate signaled that rest. The entire thing is so freaking stupid, and what's worse is that Aaron and Nate are both convinced that the nonsense rumors that they've heard are 100% true, which is making them even angrier at each other. Anastasia tells Aaron that she wants to go home and his personality does a complete 180, to the point where even Anastasia tells us that he's always in this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde sort of way. I am once again asking what's so great about this guy that not only made Anastasia stick it out with him for three years, but actively chose to live with him. Again, anything good in this situation cannot possibly outweigh the long-term health effects of Aaron forcing her to have an eating disorder. After Aaron leaves to go get Lola so that they can go home, Nate insists that he hadn't heard anything about a pregnancy. Probably because it's another rumor going around that has nothing to do with anything. However, Anastasia is now back to her, my world is ending routine. It's literally the second chapter in which she's trotted it out and I'm already super over it. She's acting like she's never going to be allowed on the ice ever again. Although considering how much she's whining about not getting into the Olympics, the book has made more of an effort to show her partying and hanging out with her boyfriend than actually practicing. The entire do as I say, not as I do thing is seriously annoying. She storms away from Nate and eventually finds Ryan whispering to Olivia. This is the girl that Lola was upset about in the first chapter, but Anastasia has never met this girl before. The narration then pauses to explain to us that Ryan and Anastasia are in what the kids call a situationship, not an actual relationship, which I guess explains what she said at the start of the chapter, which would have been nice to know before we got to this point, but whatever. She thinks that if Ryan wants to see Olivia seriously, then she'd be happy for both of them. The narration then jumps to the next afternoon, where Anastasia explains to us that her parents were kind of tapped out after spending all the money on skating gear, so she got a part-time coaching job teaching little kids how to skate. Ryan comes to find her between her lessons, bringing lunch with him. He at least has a basic decency to have brought two different lunches, a salad, but also fries and chicken nuggets. As they're eating, Anastasia tries to ask him about Olivia. However, he seems more interested in remaining with Anastasia than moving on to somebody else. Anastasia is trying to push him away and encourages him to ask out Olivia, which he reluctantly agrees to do so. Gotta set something up for the Nate Anastasia romance later. Ugh. He then asks her what happened last night between her and Aaron, so she tells him in great detail as if we hadn't witnessed this in the same chapter. Ugh. Editors? Who are they? Ryan is hung up over Aaron, generally being a terrible person to her, but Anastasia is more upset over Nate supposedly lying to her about not knowing what happened in the ring. And highlighting again that Nate doesn't even know, he literally asked a single person and determined that it was the truth. 
chapter six. The chapter starts off with Nate telling us that over the course of three weeks, the actual investigation uncovered that the hockey team at UCLA did this. Not somebody's girlfriend's or their boyfriend or whatever. Nate feels kind of bad for pinning 100% of the blame on Russ, but I'm still confused and angry that he signaled out a singular person and questioned nobody else. Nate pauses briefly to tell us that the entire team is on short notice from the school, that at any second all of their games could be stopped or the members suspended, which I think is fair, but I feel like the school is being way too nice about the entire thing, especially considering that the 20 minute tirade about delinquent behavior Director Skinner gave. Then it really slams on the brakes to tell us about Nate's toxic father, how he's one of those people who is desperate to put his own hopes and dreams off onto his children. However, it's not hockey, but skiing. Nate's little sister, Sasha, is being forced to become an Olympic skier and Nate feels so bad for her. The only consolation is that his dad hates hockey and pretty much ignores his son. Following this is a super tedious bit in which Robbie asks about the surprise birthday party that he asks his friends to throw for him. He's also apparently been dating Lola. I don't care about either of things, so next! Nate then explains to the readers that because the hockey team is encroaching upon the figure skater's rink, Coach Aubrey is ruling everybody with an iron fist, especially Director Skinner. Nate finds that it's fair, but he's also a little terrified of the woman. The girl knows how to hold a grudge with everybody except Henry, apparently. Last week, Henry saw Anastasia studying in the library alone. He brought her a coffee, which explains about the rest situation, apologized profusely, told her he told understand why she was so upset and now he's the only one of us in her good graces i don't even know who you are this book is a non-stop parade of random background characters when you couple this with the review warning that this book felt like a walking advertisement for the rest of the series yeah simply bad writing all around when a book decides that every single background character is important it then it means that not one single person in the book is important yes that also means anastasia and nader are also unimportant as well the main characters of this novel are being forced to share the spotlight with every other random character that popped into the author's head at any given time. However, this Henry person is quick to call Nate out on why it is that he's always chasing after, and I quote, girls who don't like you, which I feel like is kind of a weird thing since the narration has given us zero indication that Nate is romantically interested in anesthesia. Yet she's been randomly added to his to-do list if you catch my drift. But then again, Nate also randomly thought that Russ was the one responsible for the mess with the generator. It's too bad that this isn't a pole vaulting novel because Nate loves jumping to conclusions. Anyway, Nate catches Anastasia. She's leaving the rink and begs for her to pass along a message to Lola to come to Robbie's birthday party, and that Anastasia is also invited as well. As she leaves, she pauses briefly to say hello and goodbye to Henry. As others rip him about his good relationship with her, Henry tells them that she has a boyfriend, that she was seen first talking and then making out with Ryan. Obviously, it doesn't help Aaron fuck us all over with his big mouth. Look, nobody likes a snitch, but at the same time, it was and wasn't the fault of the team. Yes, they weren't the ones who actually went out and destroyed the generator, but come on, man. The fact that this happened and the finger was immediately pointed at them tells me everything that I need to know about their conduct. Nate fumes about how terrible of a person that Aaron is, that he often hears Aaron basically threatening Anastasia if she doesn't shape up. He tries to tell himself that Anastasia is a big girl and that this is none of his business. Aaron is now leaving the ice as the hockey team gets ready to go out. Aaron smugly tells Nate that Anastasia is interested in chasing a physical relationship with Nate, which... Again, where the hell is this even coming from? However, Aaron is so freaking rude about the entire thing that it's taking everything in Nate's willpower not to cold clock the jerk. Chapter 7 in an effort to try and force the hockey team and the figure skaters to be on better terms, Skinner demands that both sets show up to do, I kid you not, social icebreakers. Ugh, did you seriously have to use that term? Anyway, Aubrey hated that, the hockey coach hated that, Anastasia hated that, Aaron hated that, everybody disliked that. And then, because the setup for this book wasn't terrible enough as it is, Skinner set the entire thing up in the style of speed dating, where the figure skaters remain in place and the hockey team would get up and go to each one. He warns that this isn't actually speed dating, but like, I see no way that this isn't going to end in several hookups. Come on, this is stupid. Anastasia then hits the brakes to tell us that Aaron has been trying to be a lot nicer to her and Lola. I don't care. She also tells us that Ryan has been busy with his new girlfriend, Olivia. I also don't care. The slight pause then becomes even longer when she tells us about Henry coming to her to try and butter her up. This was learned in the previous chapter that he was the only one who bothered to try and reach out to her. Why specifically her? 
Rare is literally a single other figure skater outside of Anastasia and Erin. She tells the readers that Henry told her the gossip on the team, except that even the narration itself only bothers to talk about Nate ever so briefly and Russ, and literally nobody else on the team. Anyway, Anastasia sits down and her first contender is JJ. They start talking about, I kid you not, astrology. Why are they talking about their moon and rising signs? Does the author seriously think that every single person has memorized their birth chart? Like, don't get me wrong, because it's fun and all, but it's a little weird that this is a topic that they wanted to talk about. The next person is Robbie, who asks that she talk about Lola, which she does, despite telling the readers that Lola herself is not even sure what's going on in her relationship with Robbie. It seems to me as though their entire relationship is running on miscommunication. We gloss over Chris and Job, which is probably for the best, considering that this is the first time I'm seeing their names. But they both apparently made Anastasia laugh, and she hated that because she wanted her only hockey soft spot to be Henry. Up next is Russ. Ugh, are we seriously going to do a play-by-play -play of every freaking member of the hockey team? This is tedious and bad writing. Anyway, Russ doesn't say anything about the incident, which is probably for the best thing is how he didn't even do anything. It literally had nothing to do with him at all. Anastasia does most of the talking during their round. Then it's Henry, whose social battery is winning. Since he and Anastasia already know each other past the point of awkward first introduction small talk. Anastasia tells him to take a micro nap and reminds him that there's only one more person after her. However, this also means that Nate is last, the encounter that she's obviously been dreading. My main problem is that I seriously don't know why she's mad at him. He lied to her about not knowing what happened with the generator, but in the end, what he did know ended up not being what happened. So she's angry with him for not knowing what happened to the generator, which ended up being the truth anyway. Nate comes over and he basically demands a fresh start. Anastasia is still angry at him, so she refuses. Like, look, it's within your rights to hate somebody, but this is getting to the point of ridiculousness. Right as the coach blows his whistle that the event is over, Anastasia agrees to give him a probationary period of forgiveness, as I think we all knew she would. Ugh. Chapter 8 now it's time for Robbie's surprise party. So much freaking time is spent simply getting ready for this party. I would ask where the editor was, but I think that we all know that there was none. As the boys get dressed in tuxedos, Nate can't stop complaining about how every single person is friends with Anastasia now, except for him, because as I mentioned in the previous chapter, she's got some beef with him about, um, let me check my notes, not lying to her about not knowing what happened with the generator. Even when JJ tried to convince me to hire an Elvis impersonator who can do weddings, me accidentally ending up married to JJ felt like too much of a risk, so I put my foot down and said no. I went to look every single person in the eye and ask them if they know that one cannot simply have Elvis tell you that you're married and then it's a done deal. You gotta file paperwork. I also completely and utterly love how Nate has 100% expectations of getting so blackout drunk that he'd somehow agree to get married to a rando. I should probably be keeping track of how much time toxic college experiences are being shoved down our throats in this stupid book because it's quickly getting to the point of ridiculousness. When Nate finally sees Anastasia, he starts thinking with his downstairs head instead. He offers her his jacket because she's rubbing her arms and asks if she's having fun. She agrees, but then says that her only complaint is that he's the one who planned this party. Nate is quick to call her out, saying that they're supposed to be having a truce in which he gets a clean slate and she asks nice. She insists that this is her being nice, but I'm honestly not quite sure that she knows the meaning of the word. I also don't know why Nate is so obsessed with her since she's a nasty person who's honestly kind of up there with Kitty, what with her her beauty being only skin deep. They play poker with a bunch of others, and then Nate offers to let her use his private bathroom again. You know it's bad when even the book says that this is deja vu. After she comes up from the bathroom, they start to talk again. This is mainly glossed over. But then Nate asks if she's ever going to forgive him, going so far as to suggest that he can get down on his hands and knees, to which she's quick to reply that the only time a grown man should be down there in front of her, he'd better be doing something other than groveling, if you catch my meaning. Nate then calls her out, insisting that she obviously likes him. She says no, that she isn't pretending to hate him, but then he says, You don't have to like me to scream my name, Anastasia. To which she says that she could give him a map to her physical pleasure, but he still wouldn't be able to get her off. Quick question. Does the author think that this is sexy, tantalizing banter? Do readers? I'm seriously cringing myself to death over how dumb this entire thing is. 
Thanks for listening to my book snark on YouTube. New videos are up every Monday, but stick around because I sometimes drop random videos on other days too. Just as a reminder, even if you can't financially support me, there are other ways to help me out. The first is watching this video as well as all of my other videos. It's also important to like and subscribe. Finally, you can share this video with all your friends so that they can help as well. If you're already caught up with all of my videos, you can go to Tumblr for my main book snarks, always free and updated every morning. The only edit to Patreon is to become a member without paying. You'll get access to the same things on Tumblr, but on Patreon. So Supporters can have access to so many more books now starting at $1 a month. Also, new is a one-week free Patreon trial, so be sure to check that out. Special thanks to Don, Phoebe, and Nikki for supporting me on Patreon already. If you want to hear your name in my video next week, either support me on Patreon or make a one-time donation. Do you like my snarks so much that you want me to snark your writing? I do that too. For just $6 per chapter, I will tell you how awful that your writing is. But not to worry if you feel like you couldn't take the criticism. I also offer regular book editing as well, just $10 per chapter. You can contact me on any of my social media platforms if you have further questions. If you you want to read some of the things that I've written, you can purchase my works on Amazon. I have a slew of spicy short stories and two full-length novels. I also frequently run flash sales on my stories, and if you don't follow me on any social media, you might want to do so just so you know when I might be offering things for free. Links for everything will be posted below. See you next week, guys!